Okay, thanks for attending. Um, maybe a quick uh, introduction from, from my end. Uh, so I'm Max, I'm a physicist by training. Um, I spent a bit more than 10 years in academia. I did everything from microscopy over molecular dynamics to um, actual rocket science or spacecraft technology. Um, worked quite a bit in defense intelligence, at some point decided that um, I would like, like to change that, and then transferred this um, technology into the civil realm. I co-founded a company about three and a half years ago, so Constellar is an 80-people company, very happily working together with Lakestar uh, for some time now, and um, the idea of what we're doing is um, protecting food security by doing relevant measurements from space, in particular temperature. And before I go on into why that's important and how temperature is connected to food security at all, very happy to hand over to you also for a quick introduction. Sure, sounds good. Uh, hey, uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us. I know it's a, a long conference. Um, my name is Steve. Uh, I'm a partner at Lakestar leading Deep Tech Investments, uh, originally from the US, hence my funny accent, uh, currently living in Germany, uh, in Berlin. Uh, it's been a real pleasure getting to know Max over the years, so I think uh, the, you know, maybe to kind of kick us off, the, the thing that really uh, attracted Lakestar to, to Constellar in the beginning was the fact that they were solving not just one, but two of the biggest problems on the planet, uh, which is we don't have enough water and we don't have enough food. Uh, not only today, but by 2030, it's going to be a, a major problem, especially in the global south, uh, but also in the global north. And maybe I'll use that as my first uh, prompt to you, not necessarily a question, but can you share a bit about uh, some of the data that you guys uncovered when you were uh, deciding where you wanted to apply your technology and, and why you decided agriculture was the right fit? Yeah, sure. Um, so. We were, were looking at applications um, for our technology, so it was very clearly a tech push. Um, and then we came across food security, and we looked at, wow, this is a bigger dilemma than we initially thought. And this is obviously not all data we collected, but this is uh, studies from NASA, studies from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Just to give you a few numbers. So we'll need about two and a half times the area to produce crops to keep us fat in the next 25 years. The reality is that we'll have around 30% less area than we had around 2000, simply because of degrading, um, degradation of land. Um, that is alarming. Um, on top of that, um, we have to uh, implement regulations uh, to be more sustainable. So we can't just put the massive amount of fertilizer on the, um, on the fields we do right now, we have done in the past. So we we'll lose about 10 to 20% of yield, otherwise agriculture won't stay sustainable. So we can't sustain the amount of yield we need to produce. So um, on top of that, due to climate change, so moving out of the optimal range of temperatures for growing things, we lose another 46% of yield in the next 25 years. So all the tendency, all the trajectories is pointing opposite. And I mean, as you said, right, so what are the short-term changes? The short-term changes by 2030, we probably have an increase of water prices for agriculture of between six and 12 times, right? So water will become a bottom line issue. And in fact, climate change will initially manifest itself as water change. And food security is, in fact, then also water security. And in six years from now, the effect is, and this is still for a moderate scenario of 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming, that um, basic crops like rye, um, basic crops like maize, um, all of these basic crops will, on average, increase um, in cost by a factor of 3 to 4 between 2020 and 2030. And that's going to affect a lot of people. Yeah. So, so there's not going to be enough food. Uh, to service our, our growing population. The, the biggest uh, de dependency on fresh water is agriculture, and there's also not going to be enough water, and that's only going to yes. compound the problem of, of we're not going to have a high enough food, food yield. So huge problem today, the, the way people solve it, right, is they, they walk around, they put stakes in the ground, and, and they measure uh, kind of water content, or you fly a drone or a plane. Uh, like Europe, for example, 42% of the land mass of Europe is agriculture. You can't put a stake in the ground to 42% of Europe every day. So you need some scalable mechanism to do that. And that's why I thought your, your solution, the, the approach that you're taking with your technology, uh, was particularly interesting. Because not only is it solving one of the world's biggest problems, but it's doing so in a way that is uh, zero marginal cost scalable once you have a constellation in place. So maybe walk us through a little bit on, on how your technology works, uh, what it looks like. Start yeah. with simple terms, and, and we can work from there. Sure. Um, so first of all, the, the initial idea is that, OK, we need something which is massively scalable. 60% of all arable land in sub-Saharan Africa and South America, that's going to be where the food is going to be, growed, uh, to grown, to be grown also for us uh, in the next 25 years. So how do we bring technology over there? And very quickly, you realize that 
well, a lot of the things like the sticks in the ground and uh, the drones and all these things, they're super cost intensive and they don't really help to solve this in a scalable way. So the only way you have is satellites. And just to give you an impression of a single satellite takes around two to 300 square kilometers of data every second, 86,400 seconds a day. That is real scalability. And that's only one satellite. Obviously, if you have a constellation, you have a more resilient system which can take even more data. So what we're doing, in fact, is ultra-accurate temperature measurements. So temperature measurements, imagine um, a satellite at the distance of 500 kilometers can detect a change in temperature which is smaller than you would feel on your skin. That's how accurate they are. And these satellites are then monitoring any place on the globe, ideally um, once a day. And this will start leveraging um, our ability to look in and optimize the water cycle, the energy cycle, and the carbon cycle. All these three pillars, food security is um, uh, in the end resting upon. So very accurate temperature measurements to get, for example, an idea of how much water is needed, how much water is actually available in the plants. Are these plants stressed? Can they take on nutrition? Can they not take on nutrition? Are the seeds at the right planting depth? Do they have enough energy? temperature, do they have enough moisture in the soil to do that? It uh, covers things like early detection of droughts and all these things. And we will, in, in the end, it's a paradigm shift going from a very visual understanding of our world. Um, you all know that like Google Earth, you know it, um, basically when you use Google Maps, it's kind of nice, pretty pictures and it helps us navigate because this is correlating well to what you know and what you see, to the actual biophysical reality of our planet, which includes not only water, not only temperature, but eventually will also include nitrogen, uh, it will include other chemicals, it will include roofing materials and all these things. So moving to a full digital, not model, but measurement of our planet, which can then drive a massive amount of decisions in agriculture predominantly, but also obviously outside of agriculture. So my, my kind of simple version of that is, I remember during COVID, they would take your temperature at the airport when you walk yep. by with those little kind of guns, the thermal guns. So it's one of those strapped to a satellite, looking at yep. all of the agriculture on the planet in real time, uh, exactly. once you have your constellation up. And, and then in doing so, determining, okay, does that field need more water or not, right? Based on, exactly. is it warm or, or cool? Yep. Um, super, super interesting. So, so what have you seen in terms of uh, commercial pull. Who's interested in buying this? Yep. Um, how are you uh, kind of building your, your pipeline as you build your, your satellites? Yep. So most people think that we would be selling to farmers. We're not. Very quick anecdote. Been in Hanover, Agritechnica, half a million people. Um, there. We met a farmer right in the entrance, and he asked us with his funny northern German accent, hey, do you have a farm too? And then we explained about satellites, and he cracked up for like half a minute. He, he couldn't hold himself, and then he said, oh, that was good. No, seriously, what are you really doing? Yeah? Um, so hard sell to farmers. Uh, to whom we are selling is actually um, the large agri-tech companies of this world. So companies which are either producing machinery, which can then um, execute on actions, um, which based on these measurements, um, companies in the space of fertilization or any other input, right? Uh, be it nutrition, uh, be it crop protection, uh, fungicides, whatever. Um, and companies which are providing agronomic, digital agronomic advice to farmers. So companies providing farm management information systems. Those are the customers. There's obviously also a little bit of government in there, but the main customers are in this agriculture realm. Very cool. Um, and then who, who should reach out to you? Like, why, why are you here? What do you want to yeah. get out of NOAA? Uh, so <laughs> ideally, uh, those, well, those people who are within that bubble, right? So within that if you tend to have good contacts to a big fertilizer company, well, chances are we know them already, but hey, um, never hurts to have a second contact, right? So um, anybody who is working deeply in agriculture in, and is concerned about agriculture um, and might have in ways to be it on the government side, but also being on this company side into these kind of organizations, very welcome to get an intro. Awesome. And maybe uh, one last question, because we have yeah. a few seconds left. Uh, when you think about your, your vision for the company and your vision for mm -hmm. the planet, right, for your, for your children and their children. W where do you see this going over the next 10, yeah. 20 years? Um, I, I think what we'll, we have a very limited understanding of our planet at the moment. And this is obviously only one step, but I think where we'll be going to, and this is the, the vision I was alluding to um, early on, is that we start to have a really science-based approach in a lot of things we're doing. We'll stop watering fields just by gut feeling, and we'll actually look at, okay, we can measure what is the need here, what is the need in terms of fertilizer, what's the timing, and so on and so forth. But this will carry on to a lot of other sectors, right? So uh, this will influence how markets are behaving. It will uh, dampen uh, volatility in commodity prices. So we'll have a Google Earth on steroids type of um, exact replica of our planet with all the biophysical variables which matter. This is the vision.
Awesome. Thanks, Max. Hey, thanks, Steve.